it has been a while since I've had a chance to tackle the Dangers of Woo series, but you guys voted on today's episode, so today we're going to be tackling conversion therapy. Beaten with a Bible and told that I needed to repent the demon of homosexuality and expel him from my body. I was a pastor in a mega church and I was party to destroying these people. Do you have any idea of how many young people you had recommended go through conversion therapy? That I've tried to forget. I've tried to forget. In the last four years, I, I've done at least three or four funerals um, of people who took their life because of this issue. Uh, in my case, uh, I'll be blunt, he had me bottle my feces and he told me I needed to do this to be reminded where how gay men had sex. And this would correct my sexuality, which of course only increased uh, self-hatred and the shame. Uh, not coincidentally, around this time during the therapy, privately, I'd started cutting. But the most unbearable part, Cooper says, was a backpack filled with rocks that she was forced to wear all day, every day. Do you have any idea how much weight you were carrying? I think about 40 pounds. And the point of the backpack was to represent? The physical burden and pain of being gay. Hand her hands on hips, go! There are classes as depicted in the current movie Boy Erased on how to act less gay. Is this a manly shape I'm making? Or is it a girly or feminine shape? I met a producer a couple years ago who uh, wanted to create a TV show about conversion therapy and thought I'd have some funny stories. Um, I end up telling him about, about my experience and it's like this morbid. <laughs> and he was like, hmm, well, let's check some of your friends because they've got to have some good ones too. So it was like the first time I had uh, caught up with some of these people in a few years and like, Almost all of them were like doing pretty badly still. Um, and I, th I really think like this whole, the, I don't know if it's conversion therapy itself that is so damaging or if it's the circumstances that leads people into conversion therapy that are damaging. But I know that like the people that have been through this are just like struggling so hard now, like whether they admit it or not. Like, we weren't raised to love ourselves or to be allowed to exist. Like, we're going to hell because of just our presence on this earth. I didn't think I'd be doing a topic like this. Uh, at least not yet. But, well, since people like Milo Indianopolis actively create a world where bad ideas that are dead come back from the grave, well, I figure I might as well go ahead and cover it anyway. So... Conversion therapy is a pseudoscientific practice of trying to change an individual's sexual orientation from homosexual or bisexual to heterosexual using psychological, physical, or even spiritual intervention. Now, there's currently no reliable evidence that conversion therapy actually works, but there is reliable evidence that we're going to have to have an ad break real quick. Before we go any further in the video, I want to go ahead and talk about today's sponsor, Monster Legends. Now, Monster Legends is a free-to-play collecting battling game on Android and iOS. If you're a fan of Pokemon, this would be something right up your alley. You have the ability to catch various monsters throughout the game, as well as breed them together to create new ones, so you're not wholly beholden to a gotcha system while trying to get your monsters. But apparently, this is what it looks like when they do it, so... I don't know if YouTube will allow me to show such a explicit material on the platform, but you know, it, it, here here it is. Here here you go. You can also feed your monsters to get them stronger to take them into battle, so the grind is not completely and totally battle focused. Speaking of battle, there are also different PvP modes you can engage in, including special dungeons and an adventure map to go down in single player mode. If like me, even though you have the opportunity to fight in real time against your friends, you have no friends. 
Yeah. Anyway, there are also special events every week to help you discover and play new adventures. But to help you on your way, there's a download link in the description where you can get a special reward worth about $30. It comes with 50,000 food tokens, the epic monster No Rain, and 300,000 gold, which will hopefully help you on your quest to get different YouTubers who are also in this game, like Dream, Laser Beam, and Mr. Beast. In fact, you can actually see Dream right here, though, uh, they don't have me in the game. That also makes me sad. Probably because I'm friendless. Anyway, like I said, today's sponsor was Monster Legends, so before we get back into the video, just remember to check the link in the description and give them a try on your mobile device. Thanks for dealing with the ad. If I'm going to do more edited content, they're going to be more necessary going forward. So back to the topic at hand, let's go over some history before we get into the methods utilized. There's three periods of conversion therapy to cover. The Freudian period, and then the period of mainstream acceptance, and then a period after the Stonewall Riots, where gay rights activism becomes more mainstream. Beginning with Sigmund Freud, he argued that homosexuality could be removed through the use of hypnosis. Now, he was influenced originally by a guy named Eugen Steinach, who was an endocrinologist, and what he used to try to do would be to transplant testicles from straight men into gay men in order to change their orientation. He kind of thought that they were the center of all attraction, so his methods would be utilized and then ultimately fail because the immune system would reject the transplanted glands. And while that sucked for him, that kind of works out for people going forward. Freud wrote a paper called Psychogenesis of a Case of Homosexuality in a Woman, and it described his analysis of a young woman whose parents were concerned that she was a lesbian. Her father wanted the condition changed, and Freud had to note to the father that homosexuality wasn't an illness, nor was it a neurotic conflict. So, I mean, there really wasn't any changing possible, and even if it was, it would be incredibly difficult and would only work under really favorable conditions. See also, random as fuck. Freud also noted that success in conversion therapy would be defined by making heterosexual feelings possible, not necessarily by eliminating the homosexual feelings. At best, he thought he might be able to successfully make someone buy, not necessarily completely get rid of their attraction. And Freud, to his credit, wrote that most reasons people wanted to become heterosexual were superficial, such as fear of social disapproval and things like that. You know, basically, you didn't want society knowing you were the gay. These weak motivating factors would never cause someone to truly change. They could only really change for themselves, and that was even if change was possible. Ultimately, if they were changing for society, they would only be taking on a mask that made it look like they were changed. When asked to treat a woman's son for homosexuality, the dreaded disease she thought it was, he wrote this letter to her. And keep this letter in mind, it's gonna come up a lot during this video. I gather from your letter that your son is a homosexual. It is nothing to be ashamed of, no vice, no degradation. It cannot even be classified as an illness. We consider it to be a variation of the sexual function produced by a certain arrest of sexual development. By asking me if I can help your son, you mean, I suppose, if I can abolish homosexuality and make normal heterosexuality take its place? The answer is, in a general way, we cannot promise to achieve it. In a certain number of cases, we succeeded in developing the blighted germs of heterosexual tendencies, which are present in every homosexual and majority of cases. It is no more possible. It is a question of the quality and age of the individual. The result of treatment cannot be predicted. Basically, Sigmund Freud was trying to say that even if he was able to get anything done, the most he'd be able to do was maybe possibly get a little bit of movement towards the heterosexual zone, but even then it wasn't really guaranteed. So she left him a one-star review on Yelp. A succeeding Sigmund Freud was his daughter, Anna Freud, and she claimed that she could much more successfully cure homosexuals from their illness. In 1949, she published some clinical remarks 
concerning the treatment of cases of male homosexuality, and stated that patients should choose an active partner to recapture their lost masculinity. Then, by having sex with said partner, they would be able to renew their sexual potency via magic or some shit. In 1951, she published Clinical Observations on the Treatment of Male Homosexuality. Here, she argued that full object love of the opposite sex cured homosexuality. Um, I guess that bisexuals were left entirely out of that conversation. And in 1956, she argued that journalists shouldn't publish anything in regards to the previously mentioned letter uh, from her father, Sigmund Freud, because she'd become much more adept at curing homosexuals than her dad ever did. Kind of feeling like there might be some suppressed Freudian style issues there, but uh, moving on. There's other players in this story in the European front, but let's go ahead and move on to the United States. That's where I live. And Freud's ideas of psychoanalysis started to receive recognition in the U.S. in the early 20th century. During this time, the U.S. had attempted things such as bladder washing and rectal massaging and castration and hypnosis. These things were all criticized by a guy named Abraham Brill, who wrote The Conception of Homosexuality. He was a fan of Freud's psychoanalysis work, and argued that curing homosexuality basically just meant creating bisexual people who could have heterosexual relationships. Many patients that he claimed to have cured turned out to just remain being homosexuals in the end, or being bisexuals. Again, you didn't really cure the gay out of people. That didn't happen. But enter a guy called William Stiekel. Now, unlike Freud, he viewed homosexuality as a disease. This is where we get some more of the mainstream ideas that pervade at the time. He believed that through psychoanalysis, a patient could be changed into developing heterosexual feelings, much like Sigmund Freud, though he was much more confident in it than Sigmund was. If he happened to want it, though, that was kind of the key. He needed someone who wanted to be made straight in order for them to become straight. He literally believed that someone could willfully believe themselves into another sexuality. Come to the 1950s, and a guy named Edmund Burglar developed his theory for treatment. His methods boiled down to basically just blaming the victim. Burglar claimed that if gay people wanted to change, they could be cured in 90% of cases. Again, the believe yourself into it method is at play here. In other words, fake it till you make it. Burglar used what was called confrontational therapy in his research. Basically, this is where gay people were punished repeatedly in order to make them aware of their inner masochist. Burglar would repeatedly break patient confidentiality by discussing his abuses with other patients who were also receiving treatment. He would bully them, call them liars, argue that by being gay they were worthless. Burglar's ideas were popularized in the United States magazines, articles, and books around the time, but all of this stuff is aimed at non-specialists. This wasn't popularized through scientific journals. When confronted with specialists such as Alfred Kinsey, who argued that homosexuality was an acceptable way of life, Burglar would double down on his rhetoric and methods, becoming more abusive towards his patients. And remember the name Alfred Kinsey, he's gonna come up again later as well. Speaking of things that come up later, that letter from Sigmund Freud from earlier? It's still pretty important. In 1951, the mother who he wrote that letter to sent it to the American Journal of Psychiatry, where it got published for the first time in mainstream for the public to see, despite protestations from Freud's conversion therapy happy daughter years later. Now, this led to the DSM-1 classifying homosexuality as a mental disorder and not a disease. This isn't great, but it is still progress, and progress is progress. Come up to 1969, and we now enter the time of the Stonewall Riots. For all of you who still think riots can't accomplish anything, history says otherwise. You see, riots have a way of calling the public's attention to things in a way that just sitting in the ivory tower in the academic world doesn't technically do. Following the Stonewall riots, conversion therapy came under increased scrutiny by the general public, with a focus coming down on the DSM's designation of homosexuality as a psychopathology. Eventually, the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality as a mental disorder from the DSM, utilizing evidence from researchers such as the previously mentioned Alfred Kinsey, and then Evelyn Hooker and Robert Spicer. 
Critics would argue that the APA capitulating to gay rights in this way was anti-science, but after a referendum in 1974, the decision was still held up, with or without outside pressure, because science doesn't give a shit about traditionalism. This still left something called egodystonic homosexuality in the DSM, though. Basically, this was where someone has a sexual orientation that is opposite of one's idealized self. So um, imagine that in this light, homosexuals are just failed straight people. And yeah, that's still wrong, and come the DSM-3, that would be removed as well. Enter a guy named Joseph Nicolosi. He published Reparative Therapy of Male Homosexuality in 1992. And in that same year, he helped found the NARTH organization, the National Association for Research and Therapy of Homosexuality. This organization opposed the now mainstream view of homosexuality in that it was a harmless attraction and argued that in an ideal world, they would make effective psychology therapy available to all homosexuals who seek change. This is where we see a shift from all homosexuals must convert or die to the more soft but still insidious, we're just trying to offer them an option. This is still bigotry, but it's a different, more soft style. The American Psychoanalytic Association spoke against NARTH in 2004, stating that the organization did not adhere to their policy of non-discrimination, and that their activities were demeaning to their members who were gay and lesbian. The same year, a survey of members from the American Psychological Association rated reparative therapy as certainly discredited. So, uh... Yeah, they've since had to change their name to the Alliance for Therapeutic Choice and Scientific Integrity, thanks to all this discrediting. It sounds nicer, but it's still uh, trying to do the same shit. I know I'm dropping a lot of names here, but I'm also covering a lot of history, so... Enter David Satcher. In 2001, he issues a report stating that there's no scientific evidence that sexual orientation can be changed. The same year, uh, Spicer, who I mentioned earlier, was one of the key players in removing homosexuality from the DSM then, but in 2001, he would argue that some individuals could, with great effort, change from homosexual to heterosexual through a form of reparative therapy. This was recanted in 2012 due to the fact that these claims were based on incredibly small study groups, and when laid out bare, the results of those studies couldn't be replicated. He has since called this his only real professional regret after apologizing to the LGBTQ community for making such sloppy claims in the first place. In a letter dated the 23rd of February 2011 to the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, the Attorney General of the United States stated that while sexual orientation carried no visible badge, a growing scientific consensus accepts that sexual orientation is a characteristic that is immutable. Since all this, gay rights groups have found that reparative therapy existing at all increases the chances for depression and suicide in LGBTQ people, because even the existence of conversion therapy facilities or camps increases the numbers of people who are incentivized by family, supposed friends, religious leaders, and otherwise into trying these failed techniques for self-change. Now, we've gone over a few of the techniques that were used, but Let's maybe talk about them in detail to figure out why, aside from wide cred discreditation, these things aren't supposed to be used in the modern day. We have everything from electric shock therapy, fun, uh, use of tons of drugs, forced consumption of heterosexual pornography, uh, the fucking Bible being used to beat people, making gay men bottle their feces in order to be reminded of how gay sex happens, uh, the previously mentioned psychoanalysis, which basically tried to make people bisexual, fucking castration of all things, forced hormone injections, and then there's reparative therapy, which we talked about earlier. Um, reparative therapy thought that same-sex attraction was the body's way of trying to self-repair feelings of inferiority. In 2014, the Republican Party of Texas endorsed counseling, which offers reparative therapy and treatment on their party platform. That's not that long ago, guys. This is despite it being discredited by the American Psychological Association at that time. There's also sex therapy and cuddle therapy. In cuddle therapy, you're asked to cuddle a partner of the same sex to cure your attraction to them, somehow. And then in sex therapy, someone would basically make, say, a gay man have sex with a woman, or vice versa. This is sort of a, uh, you don't know what you're missing until you try it 
kind of technique. And I'm just going to go ahead and say that if this technique worked, then maybe all the heterosexual men in the world should try gay sex because, you know, you don't know what you're missing until you try it, I guess. I guess we're just really, really unique in that we know what we like and gay people obviously don't, apparently. Unfortunately for conversion therapy advocates, the only people who seem to be cured by something like sex therapy are people who were bisexual. And by cured, I mean in the Freudian sense, where they're still bisexual. So nothing really changes at all. Congratulations, you succeeded at doing nothing. I hate to let you know, though, but things do get a little darker. Uh, darker than electroshock therapy. Uh, we're talking lobotomies. There's a guy named Walter Friedman who popularized the ice pick lobotomy as a treatment for homosexuality. He performed it on as many as 3,400 people. If you don't know, an ice pick lobotomy is basically where somebody takes a thin instrument, puts it under your eyelid, and severs your prefrontal cortex. This destroys your initiative, empathy, ability to function on your own, and basically, you become mentally dull, an autonomous almost vegetable. Yeah, that might not make someone crave homosexual sex as often, uh, but it also kind of destroys them as a person. Completely. I, I wouldn't say that's worth it. Needless to say, most of these treatments are cruel and unnecessary because homosexuality, despite good old Christian arguments of the past, isn't harmful. It's just a sexual orientation, and when it's between two consenting adults, the only damage that's really caused is to a religious person's ego. The best arguments against it that Christians can muster either rely on negative psychological effects brought on by the world that they themselves created, which includes the cruel treatments to LGBTQ people, or by threatening them with an imaginary place to burn in hell for all eternity. What I mean by those is, they think if you're gay, you're going to burn in hell, and they'll argue that suicide rates are higher if you're LGBTQ, but then by arguing that repeatedly, they enforce the negative view on LGBTQ people, which becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You increase the chances that people will commit suicide when you create a crueler world around them. And so it's just cruelty, plain and simple. The methods to change it are ineffective, they're wrong, and the arguments against homosexuality are, well, ineffective and cruel. And as much as I'd like to make a bunch of jokes about a flaccid god desperately trying to fuck humanity for doing the things he designed them to do, I'll instead mention how the danger in this particular woo should be as plain as day. Unless you don't consider lobotomies, forced castration, and threats of hellfire to be, you know, dangerous to anybody's well-being or psyche. Honestly, I wish the world would wholly abandon this practice, but there's still plenty of it being used today. The argument that conversion therapy should be an option for those who want it are predicated on creating the cruel kind of world that tells homosexual people that they're broken and need that change in the first place. If the world didn't condone this kind of cruelty to LGBTQ people to begin with, well, there wouldn't be the feeling of needing to change, and then the conversion therapy wouldn't have anything to prey upon. So, if you want to suggest someone undergo conversion therapy, uh, maybe consider the opportunity that lays ahead of you. You see, there's a perfectly good pineapple in some grocery store somewhere near you, and, well, you should be cognizant of the good you can do for the world by simply taking that pineapple and shoving it directly up your ass. Now, if you enjoyed this video, maybe consider hitting the like button and subscribing, potentially even sharing it with your friends if you really loved it. I mean, hell, if you found this video to be really great and profound, maybe even consider checking out my Patreon where you get access to videos like this early and also you get some behind the scenes footage. But please remember also, check out Monster Legends. They've been incredibly helpful in sponsoring this video, and we could probably show them some love and check out their game. I mean, they're literally sponsoring a video about the dangers of conversion therapy. That says something. As always, everyone, insert end of video tagline here. <laughs>